Coming up on this week's Faz TV, we're in the northeast at Mains of Cairnboro to speak with farmer and Instagrammer Nicola Wordy about the changes she's made to improve efficiencies in her sheep enterprise. The Wordy family have found that managing triplets is key to maximising ewe and lamb performance during and after lambing. They have recently adapted to a maximum of two lambs per ewe, removing triplet lambs and reading them with a Volac milk machine. This change in farming practice has made significant improvements to their livestock system. Behind me here we've got uh, Scottish mules um, and predominantly the lamb outside and they're all put to a Texel tup. Um, started, these guys started lambing from the 23rd of March this year and I did have a few lambed early inside. Uh, again, Scottish mules put to a Texel tup. So last year uh, we got the Volac milk machine. Uh, we invested in that and that then meant that we were to change the policy and take off every triplet lamb. Uh, so left every year with two lambs and took off the third one. We found that by doing this, it gave the ewes a chance to recover better. It also let the lambs that she kept thrive a lot better and quicker um, because they obviously weren't in competition with three lambs for the milk. And then the lamb that we took off went onto the machine and it did really well on the machine. The lamb that we take off, it very much depends. Um, quite a lot of our triplets this year have been really even. Um, so it's it, you know, there's not really been much in it, there's not really a size difference. If there was a, a very small one, yes, we would lift it, um, but otherwise it tends to just be a case of pick one. On, on the whole, they are really good and they are very quick to get onto the machine. That's one thing um, that we found great with it as well, is that they, they get onto it quickly and they thrive really well on it from the get-go. Uh, obviously, they're, they're never going to do as well as if they were on a yow, but compared to the system we used to work, they definitely do a lot better. Since using the machine, there's definitely been a lot less time spent cleaning the, the old buckets that we used to use, topping it up. Just like, I think mum worked out, it was about four hours a day was just spent doing that, putting them to, cleaning it, mixing new milk, stuff like that. So it's definitely saved a lot of time in that sense. Hygiene we find is a lot better as well for them, and also the lambs. We find that the lambs do better because the milk's constantly there, it's constantly warm, and they can kind of go and go to it as and when they please, a bit like being on a yow. We found this is only our second year um, taking the third lamb off, but what we found last year was that the lambs that were left with the yow, they continued to go on and thrive really well, and therefore when it came to having lambs ready at the end, they were, there was a much bigger batch ready at the same time, as opposed to having it sort of dragged out a lot. And also we found that the yows that were left with three, you'd always have one lamb that just didn't do as well. So we've cut that out and we don't have any lambs that are sort of not, not thriving as well at the end of the year. It's also allowed the yows to recover a lot better. This year we found in our scanning results that there's been slightly less triplets, but more twins, which is obviously what you want. In terms of yow condition, um, we've found that the yows have held their condition a lot better and that also there's been fewer cases of mastitis after we've started taking off the third lamb. Obviously we've only done it for a year so after this year we'll see if there's a pattern there. The lambs we found as well, um, because the two, two lambs that have been left on the yow have continued to thrive really well, they have then finished slightly quicker. Um, and on a whole our lambs finished a lot better and the price was still higher at the time that they sort of came to a finish. The third lamb that we took off, the triplet, uh, the pet, um, again because they were inside on the machine they continued to thrive really well and because the machine was more like a yow for them they then ended up finishing quicker also when the price was still slightly higher. So for us it's worked out last year that our pets actually made us money we're really strict with our pets. When they, they start on the machine, we take the start date and then five weeks, they get five weeks on the milk and then it's hard and fast. We've done this, before we got the machine we did this and we found that that was the best case scenario was just to cut them off at five weeks. Um, and they then, they always get uh, 
hard feed alongside the milk so they're kind of getting used to that as well and then when you do stop the milk it's not a huge shock to them and then they continue to thrive on the hard feed and then finish for a good price. The pet lambs we don't put them outside we we used to a few years back but we decided that they, it was better and they finished a lot quicker for them to stay in the shed and just finish straight from the shed also because a lot of them are coming off at a few hours old they've never seen grass before so we found that when we put them out to grass they didn't know what to do and they didn't know what to eat so they then started to go backwards so we've decided just to keep them inside. Taking off the third lamb has definitely been a big benefit to us. Yes it has increased our pet numbers but we found that with the machine it has then paid off so I think yeah a big benefit to us has been taking off the third lamb you then have a good strong healthy yow with a pair of lambs on her She's in good condition for the following year. The lambs finish well off them. So I would say it's definitely been a huge benefit to us. Hugh Thompson, the Wardy's local vet, works closely with the family and sees the benefits of these changes firsthand. My name's Hugh Thompson. I'm um, one of the clinical directors at Seafield Veterinary Group in uh, Keith. Busy farm animal practice at this time of year. I have, uh, I'm also a farmer myself, so I like to think I can look at um, both sides of the fence and uh, hopefully be quite pragmatic in my approach to uh, helping our, our clients. I've worked with the Wordy family since I came back to the area, having worked in the south of England, um, Dumfries and Galloway as a farm vet, been a farm vet for about 15 years. Um, really great family to work with. Um, we're heavily invested um, with them in terms of attention to detail. We do kind of health planning visits, um, once or twice a year, we spend about an afternoon with the whole family, and um, we go through. You know, usually when we first started, it was you know kind of fairly major things, but now we're we're getting down to the stage where just little tweaks here and there, hopefully to improve performance. And I like the idea of the bottlenecks, and you know the bottlenecks have have changed, and now they're just small ones rather than slightly bigger ones on, on certain units. So, um, so the practice itself, we've um, we're a mixed practice. Um, we've got about eight or ten vets, um, about four or five full-time equivalent farm vets and then um, we cover kind of Murrayshire, Aberdeenshire. Very busy time of year at the moment, difficult to avoid bags under your eyes for lambings and calvings and things like that. I think with, with regards animal welfare, um, the issue we have is that, you know, three lambs, um, in most cases the ewes are just not equipped to, to deal with three lambs adequately. So um, what can happen is that, you know, we know that birth weight can be an issue so if a lamb's between three and five kilos when it's born um, it's far higher chances of survival than if it's say below three kilos and quite often with triplets you will get issues with um, small lambs and, and those lambs are far less likely to thrive again if they're competing with their two other siblings for, for milk and colostrum so withdrawing one lamb um, potentially increases the chances of all um, not only the lambs surviving but also the chances of those lambs actually growing at a you know, a rate that would be acceptable for, for, for the production on the farm. So I think, again, one of the biggest causes of lamb mortality would probably relate to birth size triplets would because of potentially that um, two teats being shared out between three lambs, it may be that one stronger lamb gets on and withdraws a lot of the colostrum quite quickly. So the chances of all those lambs surviving are far reduced than they, if say it was twins or a, or a single lamb. So um, they are, um, with, with regards to colostral um, antibody transfer and things like that, you know, uh, many units, including this one, would probably top up those lambs with, with some um, you know, additional colostrum. And we would advise that for triplets. Um, their, their odds of disease um, transmission or you know picking up disease would be far higher. In real terms the energy requirements um, of a good immune system are quite high so the first thing that tends to give is that their immune system drops. Again if that ties in with not getting adequate passive transfer from colostrum their, their disease risk is far higher so if we can focus on that lamb being nourished from say day two, day three be it on a milk machine or whatever, then if they're getting adequate nutrition from the milk on the machine, then they will be growing at a desired rate. Their chances of disease transmission are, are far reduced. So from that respect, um, you know, there's, there's no risk of that lamb failing to get adequate milk in the first three days, three or four days, which are, are really the, you know, the golden time for making sure that we get lamb survival. You know, most lamb losses occur you know, a week pre-lambing through to a couple of weeks post-lambing and that's really the time you want to focus your attention on. 
In terms of like lamb survival um, with multiple lambs, we've, we've as a you know as a profession really we've moved away from prophylactic antibiotic use in um, in at lambing time, uh, whereas historically a lot of lambs would have been you know blanket treated with an antibiotic when they were born to prevent diseases like watery mouth and things like that. So we've moved away from that and in doing that, you know, we've removed a safety net for some of our clients where it relies on improved um, colostrum management, improved um, hygiene around lambing um, pens and things like that or the environment they're born into. So it removes that um, safety point where it relies on, you know, getting the antibodies they need from their, from their mother. Again, withdrawing that third lamb from a, a ewe that's potentially equipped to handle two successfully means that it doesn't put nearly so much strain on, on that ewe. And in, re in real terms, pre-lambing, you cannot feed a ewe for three lambs. Like she, she's going to be losing condition off her back. So she's probably already in a, in a poor metabolic state. Her liver is going to be having to work harder. And again, once, once those three lambs are born, she then has to milk hard for, to, to rear them all. So withdrawing that lamb allows the ewe to potentially lose less body condition, she will still lose, but um, it allows that convalescence following lambing to be smoother, um, potentially she, her milk yield will improve as she you know, reaches peak milk yield two to three weeks after she's um, after the lambs are born. There's there's obviously the the, the focus in the, in the early stages is obviously um, you know hygiene and making sure that the, the lamb becomes accustomed to the, the feeding machine. Um, so whether that, you know, that, that would be a question really for um, the guys on farm, um, but in real terms, it's making sure that they are getting the milk, especially if they're in a big group. So it might be that that involves some bottle feeding for a start before they get introduced onto the machine. Um, so you really want to just make sure they are feeding. It's, it's not like a calf machine where you can, each individual calf, you can see whether they're not feeding or not. So it does require a, an element of attention to detail from the farmers themselves. Going on from there, um, at the other end, then really it becomes more of an economic consideration as well. That you know, the, my understanding is that you know by week six, week seven on milk, you, you, they really want to be on to eating hard feed um, because it's obviously far cheaper to feed them uh, hard feed than it is milk powder. So um, I think my understanding is the economics of it work uh, on the basis that, that it is a, a period of time of transition and the sooner you can get them eating hard feed the better really and again by that time the lambs you know well on the way to, to you know to getting the growth rates that you'd expect them to get. To summarise um, in terms of three main pieces of advice um, the first one would it, you know still the whole thing still revolves, revolves around hygiene um, around that um, birthing period so if you can reduce the disease challenge by you know having lambs born into clean pens clean environment um, clean teats on the ewe um, that reduces the challenge massively on on the newborn lambs so their chances of disease are reduced adequate passive transfer of colostrum would be the second point and um, we know that adequate passive transfer will dictate the lamb's performance throughout its life so the first kind of two or three hours will dictate that and map out that lamb's you know the rest of its its life so um, that would be another major point so again investment in time to make sure the lamb has fed if there's not uh, adequate colostrum on the ewe then it would be a case of supplementing those with either a ewe that's um, got surplus colostrum on a single or um, potentially like a colostral replacer. Um, a third point would be um, probably ewe condition, so getting your ewe condition right pre-lambing, ensuring, again, probably with no, the knowledge of scanning in mind, um, your singles and triplets can be fed um, with the view that they will mobilise some back fat, but they're not going to be in a position where they, they won't milk when they're, and also it allows the ewe the, um, the energy reserves and to, to milk when she actually, when the lambs are born and, and she goes on to rear the lambs. My name's Alan Smith, I work for Bolak in Scotland. I'm a Scottish business manager. And Bolak are a business that we're going to talk about today is in general is, is a, the calf and lamb milk powder. We make lamb and calf milk powder down in Wales from British Quay. And what we're going to talk about today is how we actually then put it onto farm, on farm and through a, through a lamb machine. So Bolak have been making lamb milk powder for about 50 years and we've got a tried and tested product 
you know, with good trial data behind it. And we've got a blueprint about how we like to farmers to go in and feed it to their lambs through either a bottle or through a, a bucket or through a, a, a lamb feeder we're going to talk about today. The, the machinery manufacturers themselves say it can feed 240 lambs. So there's eight ports out to mixing jug, mixing jar, and then those ports we can put in Y branches, and you can go to 16 teats, and then on in, in each teat we recommended 15 lambs to a teat, but you can go more than that. But that machine is capable of doing 240 lambs. Actually, the most important thing we really need to do before we start doing anything is get a good power supply. It's a 16 amp power supply, um, so it's a 3.2 kilowatt boiler in it. So we really need to make sure we do that and we don't, short, we don't have any shortcuts in that at all. So a 16 amp power supply, and then we also need a very good water supply. We need a constant water supply. The water supply has got to be two and a half bar minimum, but it's got to be constant. So what you don't want is you don't want cattle drinking off that same water supply, because that will change the calibration of the water going into the feeder and change the calibration. So that's what you need to begin with. Good, water, good power supply, and a good water supply. And then you need to put it in a building where you're not going to get badly affected with frost. You've got to be able to direct your, your teats to different parts, different pens. So you've got to have plenty of room to, to then put your feed lines down to, down to different teats. So once you've got that set up, you know, that's, that's a big part of it. Thereafter, actually, what actually happens with these machines is when you buy them and you buy them through an engineer. So fortunately, what you do is you laze with an engineer he, he comes and makes sure your power supply is correct, your water supply is good, and he installs the feeder. And when he installs the feeder, he calibrates it, and he makes sure that that feeder's all set up to feed lambs before he leaves. He also then gives you a backup in case there's any problems, which fortunately we don't have many, but he is also there at a backup if there's any, any servicing or any, any problems throughout the, the lambing period. Because at this particular time of year, as I mentioned, the lambing here, they're calving here, and then when it dries up, they'll get spring work. So, you know, the, the fact that this machine can go and put out consistent milk portions of uh, one milk to, to each lamb. The other great benefit of the machine is we know from our trial work that the live weight gains you get out of an automatic feeder are better than feeding on a bottle or a, or a bucket. So we know that the trial work we've done, the live weight gains of these lambs are particularly good. Earlier I mentioned about setting up one of these machines on farm. So obviously what I mentioned, uh, firstly we need a really good power supply. So it's got to be a 16 amp uh, power, not a 13 amp. The other thing that's vitally important is we have a good water supply. It needs to be two and a half bar minimum and it needs to be constant throughout the day. We don't want that pressure getting any less. So if that's all set up, that's great. Our uh, hopper here holds 30 kilograms. So that gives us a good amount of milk powder if you've got an awful lot of lambs like they do in, on this farm. So the milk powder goes in here. It can generally be put in free flow milk powder. And it, down here in the free flow milk powder comes out. And at the same time as it mixes, the water comes in through this nozzle here, the milk powder comes out and it's all calibrated at, to work at the same time to give you a consistent concentration. The one, the one uh, milk powder mix sits in here and then it feeds through these different ports, these different lines over to the teats of the lamb and shed and obviously you might have the smaller lambs closer to the machine and then you've got warmer milk whereas you might have your, uh, your, your bigger lambs further away from the machine. So this milk that's sitting in here, there's a small heater at the bottom here that keeps it warm and that means that we're never getting through the night, we're not getting the milk getting really cold, which obviously is a big benefit. And this, this then allows the, cat, the lambs to get uh, little and often of good warm milk. The great thing about the eco-feeder here is we can also change the temperature very easily. We can actually have the temperature uh, gauge here going down to 20, 25 degrees, and you can change it very easily, but we also can put the water temperature up to 50 degrees and that then allows us to wash out this milk jug here. So that allows to keep everything nice and clean. So one of the things that's really important is getting the concentration of the mixed portion of the milk, correct? And that's where we use, we can use a refractometer. 
So you might use one of these in your farms to test the colostrum of your uh, used milk or your suckler cow milk. You can buy these in Amazon for about £17. They're as cheap as chips. And what, what I do is I go in and get a sample of the milk portion and then I put it on my, my glass, put it up to my eye and that, that means we now know the concentration of that mixed portion. Nicola is passionate about agriculture and uses Instagram to share her farming lifestyle to educate and inspire others in the sector. My biggest highlights probably are lambing. Love it. Love ha having new life on the farm. You know, even if you have to help it, you know, having that, being able to help something uh, into the world or seeing it come into the world, uh, watching it grow and being proud of the product that we produce at the end of the day and knowing that it's had the best life possible. I think that's, that's definitely a highlight for me is, is proud, proud to produce what we do. For my Instagram account, um, it's Instagram and Facebook at livestock underscore farm her. So I started that in January 2021. I'd kind of been thinking about it for a few years and sort of humming and haying and I just hadn't plucked up the courage to do it. I thought, well, now's the time. And I'm here every day, I'm doing the jobs, I'm doing the work. So it just takes an extra couple of seconds to take a picture, take a video. And I try to educate, inspire people into farming and give them an insight into what goes on on a working farm because for, for everyone it's not possible to, to get to a farm to see it. So if they can get it on their phone and just scroll through and have a look, then you know that's a win for me. But the biggest thing for me is to try and educate and inspire people. And I, I show the good and the bad. I think it's really important to, to explain why, why we do things, what way we do things, um, but also share when things don't go right because at the end of the day, we have to deal with it. Um, and so I think it is really important to, to show the good and the bad sides to it. I do what I do because I love it. Um, you know, there's very few jobs that you can get up every day and, you know, be glad to be going to your work. Like, th this isn't, to be honest, this isn't really work. This is living the dream. Um, you know, that sounds really cringy, but you know, on days like this, it makes the job a piece of cake. Okay, the weather isn't always perfect and the weather has a lot to play in farming, but thankfully the good days outweigh the bad. Um, and for every one bad day you get, you get 10 good days. And when they're good, they're good. But then when they're bad, they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tiffany Stevenson from SAC Consulting, bringing you this week's Rural Roundup. Today we're going to be talking about the agricultural reform map, talking about calving intervals in suckler cows, as well as the emergency approval of Agila. So the Scottish Government have recently published a revised agricultural route map. So this has been published setting out the wider land and agricultural change plan for Scotland from 2023 through until 2032. So in 2025, as part of the process of changing to the new agricultural support framework, which will begin in 2026, there will be um, a few different measures which will be introduced in 2025. So the first of these is the foundations of a whole farm plan. So this is looking to include soil testing, animal health and welfare declarations, carbon audits, biodiversity audits, and supported business planning. Um, secondly, there'll be new conditions to the Scottish Suckler Beef Support Scheme, and this will be linked to your calving interval. So this is to try and encourage livestock keepers to reduce the emissions intensity of the cattle production um, systems. And also there'll be new protection for peatlands and wetlands. So greening requirements will not be changing in 2025. However, there will be some more um, conditions put on to receiving your basic payment scheme. So this is aimed at making businesses more efficient. Um, so the new conditions um, will apply. So there are a few conditions which farmers will have to meet. 
So firstly, they'll have to meet essential standards in farming activity, um, climate response, biodiversity gain, whilst also being able to safeguard animal health and welfare standards, as well as workers' rights. So in 2026, the basic payment scheme will end and base support and enhanced support measures will be introduced. So as one of the things being introduced in 2025, I mentioned that carving intervals uh, was going to be important. So carving interval is a key efficiency metric um, in beef production systems. So a longer carving interval equates to lower numbers of calves um, being sold per year. Also, there's higher greenhouse gas emissions associated with it because there is less kilograms of beef being sold off the farm during the year. There has recently been a report published um, looking at calving intervals. This is the Calving Intervals in Scotland's Cattle Population Report. And in this, it highlighted that the mean calving interval of suckler beef um, cows in Scotland is 400 days, with 12% of animals having a calving interval of 14 months or longer. This really highlights how many inefficiencies there are and the potentially people carrying passengers in their system. It has recently been announced that emergency approval of Agilam for vacuum control has been denied for 2023. So following recommendations from the Expert Committee on Pesticides and from HSE, the Scottish Government has decided not to authorise the use of Agilox for the 2023 season. So the reason for this is that it was found to pose too great a risk to the environment and to human health. So these adverse um, effects of Agilox outweighs the potential benefits of using the product. There will be some farmers out there that will be requiring to spray Agilox for vacuum control in their EECS 2023 contracts. Um, this previous approval will now be changed, so the farms will be able to use mechanical or manual control of vacuum only. Have a look on the SASA website for further information about this. Thank you for listening. See you again next time.